Welcome everyone to the second annual War Abolisher Awards. My name is David Swanson. I'm the executive director of World Beyond War. Much of this program will be in English and part of it in Italian. And we have simultaneous interpretation by Raquel Cosentino and Maria Antonietta Porto. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, click on the interpretation button, which looks like a globe. Then select the language you would like, English or Italian. If you are joining from a mobile device, click the three dots, then tap language interpretation, then tap the language you would like to hear, and then click done. If you run into problems with interpretation, please let us know using the chat box. A reminder to our speakers to please speak slowly and clearly to make interpretation easier. Benvenuti tutti ai sec second annual War Abolisher Awards. Mi chiamo David Swanson e sono direttore esecutivo di World Beyond War. Gran parte di questo programma sarà in inglese e parte di esso in italiano. E abbiamo l'interpretazione simultanea di Rachele Cosentino e Maria Antonietta Porto. Nella parte inferiore dello schermo Zoom, fai clic sul pulsante interpretazione che sembra un globo. Quindi seleziona la lingua che desideri, inglese o italiano. Se ti unisci da un dispositivo mobile, fai clic sui tre punti Quindi tocca interpretazione linguistica, quindi tocca la lingua che desideri ascoltare e quindi fai clic su fine. Se riscontri problemi con l'interpretazione, faccelo sapere utilizzando la casella di chat. Un promemoria ai nostri oratori di parlare lentamente e chiaramente per facilitare l'interpretazione. Grazie. To turn on captions, click on CC. As always, this will be recorded and the video and all relevant links and information raised in the course of the event will be sent to you in a follow-up email. Our organizing director, Greta Zaro, is helping out and she and I will be facilitating questions to our honored speakers at the end of this webinar. You can put questions into the chat at any time or plan to use the raise hand button when we get to that part of the program. We are here today to present four awards to the most outstanding individuals and organizations we could identify as advancing the structures and the culture needed for war abolition. With the Nobel Peace Prize and other nominally peace-focused institutions so frequently honoring other good causes, or in fact, wagers of war, World Beyond War intends its awards to go to educators or activists intentionally and effectively advancing the cause of war abolition, accomplishing reductions in war making, war preparations, or war culture. World Beyond War received hundreds of impressive nominations, the World Beyond War Board, with assistance from its advisory board, made the selections. The awardees are honored for their body of work directly supporting one or more of the three segments of World Beyond War's strategy for reducing and eliminating war as outlined in the book, A Global Security System, an Alternative to War. They are demilitarizing security, managing conflict without violence, and building a culture of peace. Today, we will honor and hear from an environmental organization that has prevented military operations in state parks in Washington state, a filmmaker from New Zealand who has documented the power of unarmed peacemaking, Italian dock workers who have blocked the shipment of weapons of war, and British peace activist and member of parliament, Jeremy Corbyn, who has taken a consistent stand for peace despite intense pressure. Part of our goal is to make all of this work better known and better supported. You can help by sharing this video and by donating to a fund that will go to our awardees organizations and to World Beyond War. Greta, if you're able, can you please put that link in the chat? Thank you. Now, on to presenting the awards. The awards have recently been mailed to the awardees. If any of them have arrived, please be ready uh, to lift them up. I know that at least uh, one has. 
In a moment, our World Beyond War president, Kathy Kelly, is going to present the Organizational War Abolisher of 2022 Award to the Whidbey Environmental Action Network, or WEEN, based on Whidbey Island in Puget Sound, Washington State in the United States. And we will hear from Mariana Dane and Larry Morell, who are accepting the award. Then our Vice President Liz Remerswall will present the Individual War Abolisher of 2022 Award to filmmaker William Watson in recognition of his film, Soldiers Without Guns, an untold story of unsung Kiwi heroes. We will hear from Will Watson about his work and the people and the events in his film. Next, I will be back to present the Lifetime Organizational War Abolisher Award of 2022 to the Colectivo Autonomo Lavoratori Portuali, or CALP, and the Unione Sindicale di Base Lavoro Privato, USB, in recognition of the blocking of weapons shipments by Italian dock workers who have blocked shipments to a number of wars in recent years. We will hear from his Jose Nivoy, who is accepting the award. Finally, World Beyond War board member, Alison Broinowski, although I may be filling in due to technical difficulties, will present the David Hartso Lifetime Individual War Abolisher of 22 Award to Jeremy Corbyn, who will accept it and discuss his work. Then there will be time for questions and answers, but now please welcome Kathy Kelly. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. And, you know, thinking of this award, the Organizational Award for Abolishing War, I'm, I'm mindful of a sonnet by Elizabeth Barrett Browning. She wrote, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. So with me, Environmental Action Network, how do we thank you? Let us count the ways. And in thanking you, we should certainly count the many places that can benefit because of your constancy, steadfastness, research, outreach and the determination you used as you pursued a court case forbidding the United States Navy SEALs to use your parkland for training exercises. And, and since 2016, with the Environmental Action Network radiated a message that encourages activists in other parts of the world where United States military operations directly affect civilians. Thanking you must be California activists in Diablo Canyon protesting nuclear power facilities built in an active earthquake zone near the San Andreas Fault. Your careful campaign must inspire activists in Texas who are a coalition of groups right now in Washington, D.C., suing the United States government to prevent radioactive dumps in Texas. Hawaiian Islanders who struggle to stop the U.S. military from contaminating their water can be grateful for your inspiring success. And in faraway zones, war zones in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria, where burn pits at bases cause terrible sickness, affecting military and civilians alike, where unexploded ordnance is scattered across the lands and it will prolong wars. Your care for military and civilian people affected by wars carries a tender and desperately needed message. Effectively, how can we listen to earth and abolish war. So today it's simply wonderful to celebrate the Whitney Environmental Action Network's ability to go up against the United States Navy and emerge with a ruling that forbids the US Navy SEALs from using your parks, marinas, beaches, and sacred lands for military training. In celebrating your award today, we honestly can't count all our reasons to be grateful. And thinking about what makes World Beyond War tick, we especially thank you for your commitment to nonviolent action 
as you created your campaign. Thank you for organizing and caring about the post-traumatic stress, for recognizing and caring about the post-traumatic stress affecting people within the military and advocating for their well-being. Thank you for finding security in unarmed relationships and friendships and for building possibilities for peacekeeping with people in other lands who share your concerns. Please be assured that as our treasurer, John Ruer, travels to Ukraine to learn more from people there attempting to prevent a possible nuclear catastrophe there, he will bring with him the story of your success. And thank you for speaking with us today. Mary Annie Dane and Larry Morrell, please accept World Beyond Wars Organizational War Abolisher Award for 2022. Well, thank you very much, uh, Kathy. Uh, I will kick it off here and uh, Marianne will finish it up. First, I will start with uh, sharing my screen. Uh, I am uh, Larry Morrell. Um, I was part of the team uh, that was formed in order to uh, highlight this issue and to create an action uh, plan in order to prevent the Navy from continuing its uh, training in, uh, in our state parks. We have um, various people who have helped us throughout this uh, campaign. Uh, we basically had an issue with the US Navy planning to increase the training uh, that they were already conducting without public knowledge. Uh, their plan was to create um, basically every other week a training situation here in Washington State uh, around our Puget Sound these training activities would have included uh, Navy Special Forces operations, also known as SEALs. The SEALs are probably <clears throat> one of the most lethal fighting groups uh, in the world. And they were about to be uh, mixed with uh, recreation, picnickers, beachgoers, swimmers in our state parks without notification to the public. And this would have happened in any of our 28 state parks we have aligned the Puget Sound area uh, around the region. Uh, this is a, a brief map that shows uh, our very um, intense water resources we have around Puget Sound. And the Navy would have been training in um, about half of the coastline uh, had this plan uh, proceeded. The Navy already has uh, over 42 miles, that's about 70 kilometers uh, of shoreline in Puget Sound under its control already. This plan would have more than doubled the amount of shoreline and included civilian training and recreation areas as well. What the plan was, was to create a realistic training scenario where the Navy special operations forces would have infiltrated via submersibles, uh, swum along the shoreline, uh, and emerged in onto the beaches at night. At nighttime then, they would have um, traversed the beaches to shoreline uh, areas and conducted special reconnaissance from upland areas. Uh, these special reconnaissance operatives would have remained in place for up to 72 hours. So three days of observation in our state parks. They also requested uh, training areas that have uh, very sensitive uh, cliffs around the area to do high angle climbing. Uh, that was a, a new, new request from the Navy. This was actually a long time in coming. Uh, unbeknownst to the public, the Navy had been conducting training occasionally for over 30 years in our state parks. And this was being done without public notice and without proper permits. This was uh, highlighted a few years ago in 2016. The uh, public finally got notification of this uh, almost accidentally with a presentation done by the Navy to the State Parks Commission. The 
Parks granted a five-year permit in 2015 without any public notice for five parks along Puget Sound. And then shortly thereafter announced plans to expand up to, to up to 28 parks, which were basically all the parks that have shoreline around Puget Sound. As a result, we formed a group called Not In Our Parks in 2019. We engaged public uh, events. We also attended uh, county and city commission meetings. We got great support from local officials who were caught surprised that this was actually planned. The most common response we received when we told people about these plans was disbelief. No one could believe that the Navy would be conducting military operations actually at the same time as people are recreating in our state parks. We generated thousands of comments, uh, almost exclusively opposed to this. The entire process was slowed considerably in 2020 because of the pandemic, but the commission eventually voted four to three in a very uh, emotional meeting in January of 2021 to allow this to proceed. As a result, we had 30 days to file a, an appeal. And so Ween's attorneys uh, got on the case, filed the appeal uh, within 30 days, and about 14 months later uh, received a positive uh, ruling from the courts. This is one of the few cases that we're aware of where the public has actually succeeded in preventing the military from participating in public lands um, using military operations. One of the very key points of the success for us was forming coalitions. Uh, we reached around the state and indeed around the world to form partnerships with people who had similar views that the military does need to be contained. Uh, as a result, these partnerships generated thousands of signatures on petitions. We received donations from around the planet, and we also received accommodations, as we're seeing today, recognition that the efforts can indeed be successful if you have a pretty good plan. The idea was to create a, a coalition. And so we had a steering committee comprised of some people who have some deep background as uh, volunteer coordinations, uh, writers. Uh, we generated uh, a considerable amount of articles. Uh, we also got good local press uh, coverage and actually press coverage as far away as New York, uh, the Columbia um, Press published an article about this situation, which also generated additional national and international attention. Uh, we want to give a huge shout out to the law firm of Bricklin and Newman in Seattle. They're an environmental uh, focused law firm. Uh, Zachary Griefen and Brian Telligen uh, created a wonderful case uh, that basically the judge had absolutely no qualms about issuing a very uh, rare decision right from the bench. So on the day of the hearing, the judge basically said, I'm ready to decide. And he acknowledged all the counts that the Wien lawsuit uh, alleged as uh, inappropriate action and agreed that the state law did not allow military training in state parks. So not only did we prevent the expansion, but we eliminated the existing status quo of the Navy doing a limited amount of uh, training in state parks. So we're very, very pleased. Uh, we're always uh, vigilant, of course. The uh, Navy uh, will never give up. The military will keep coming after us. Uh, so the ruling states that our current law does not permit military training in state parks. Uh, however, we know that the laws can be changed. And so part of our ongoing effort is to be very diligent, uh, watch for actions in our state legislature to be sure the law does not be, is not changed to uh, allow this, this sort of activity in the future. We have two websites to direct people to, the Whidbey Environmental Action uh, is our sponsor website for the, cam the campaign that we called Not In Our Parks. The Not In Our Parks website is still active and we're still encouraging people to pay attention to this issue so that it doesn't reemerge and surprise us uh, unexpectedly. With that, I'll turn it over to Mary Ann, who will then uh, talk some more about the Wien's wider efforts. 
Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, I don't know how to go about this. Are you uh, muted? Huh? No? You're, yes, you're, we can hear you. You're good. Good. <laughs> okay, so I am Marion E. Dane, and I don't know if you can see Steve Erickson is beside me. Uh, we started Whidbey Environmental Action Network back in 1989. We've been doing this for a while. <laughs> um, basically, humans, our, our underlying philosophy is humans are part of the global ecosystem. If we humans want to survive on planet Earth, we need to take care of the other parts of the global ecosystem because we can't do it without the rest of the system. So that leads to NIMBY, not in, our, not in my backyard. And we are often accused of, oh, that's just a NIMBY issue. And this one, well, it's just in, in Puget Sound and the Washington coast. The, our working philosophy for all these years has been, we take care of our backyard, you take care of your backyard, everybody takes care of their backyard and all of our backyards will be taken care of. So that's that's been our operating philosophy for a long time. Uh, so uh, much of our work has been local and regional issues. And then we discover that when you work on a local or regional issue, it has much larger implications. It spreads out much farther than you ever realize. Much of our work has been advocacy. We have discovered that if you stand up and say a thing, all of those other people who didn't have the nerve to stand up go, yeah, that's right. And suddenly it becomes a major public issue rather than just going on by. So we have done an awful lot of we're the ones who stand up and say, hey, this is an issue. And other people go, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, we do a lot of counseling and mentoring of people in mostly other parts of Washington state who are dealing with usually environmental issues, although they end up turning into much larger political issues. And I am very pleased and proud to say that as of April 1 of this year, we are no longer in litigation with anybody. Uh, we have been in constant litigation since 1996. And it is very nice not to be in litigation for a change. So we've had. Uh, I mean, the military, the U.S. military, the biggest one, is a major threat to our global ecosystem, and I think we see that all over. And uh, various issues in various parts of the country were brought up. Yes, our military is a danger. I mean, we speak of security, but, um, you know, how secure are we when the people who claim they are protecting our security are, are damaging the system that that uh, maintains all of us. So our local military issues, um, we've got a huge groundwater contamination problem from PFAS. And that was the US Navy uh, doing uh, um, firefighting practices and the foam they use is basically it's PFAS. And now our groundwater is contaminated. Uh, the Navy is slow to accept responsibility, <laughs> shall we say. And there are the, the growlers, the, the jets that are so loud that when they come flying overhead, they will crack your foundation. Uh, if it'll crack your foundation, it'll do terrible things to your brain and to your, <laughs> you know, your inner organs. And it does things to the school children that the growlers fly over. There is another group that is working hard and heavy on this. And Larry has been a part of that group. And, you know, give credit where credit is due. They've been doing a really great job. Uh, so the, the Navy in, in their attempt to use our, our state parks, they had their reasons. 
one of their reasons was, well, your shorelines are better than our shorelines. We've already trashed ours, so now we want yours, which we thought was a fairly specious reason. <laughs> Uh, then they, uh, we were told that the State Parks Commission in their uh, uh, permitting process said, oh, there will be no surveillance. That, that was a condition of the permit. There will be no surveillance of members of the public. And the next sentence said, there will be observation of members of the public. Uh, it was an interesting question. Could you please explain the difference between surveillance and observation? And how will members of the public be aware of this difference? And the judge, one of the members of the State Parks Commission, a young woman of color, uh, she brought up what was called the creep factor. That's what she called it. And of those thousands and thousands of comments we got, people kept saying, uh, the comments were to the effect of, this gives me the creeps. I'm not gonna go to the park if you do this. And so she brought up that creep factor that this scared people. It made people un uncomfortable, unhappy, and they weren't gonna use the parks. And the judge in his uh, uh, decision talked about the creep factor and that he searched his uh, uh, law books and he searched decisions and he could find no other more official legal term. And so he fell back on, yes, the creep factor. This gives people the creeps. They don't want to be in places where the military is training. Marianne, may I thank you very, very much for speaking with us. I we have the, um, the three more awards to present. So David, yeah. has let me know that we should wrap it up, okay? Okay, Thank let's you. move on. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Let's, I think we're going to our vice president, Liz Remerswall, or do you want that video, Liz? Yes, let's have the video of our next award for the filmmaker, Will Watson. Okay, let me know if you can see and hear this video, okay. Wait, I think I need to do that better. Let me, let me try and do it correctly. No, I did do it correctly. Okay, here we go. Bogumbel was a paradise. Len is our heartbeat. Fire. The Stillman will not take our land. There is going to be a guerrilla style of warfare here shortly. It was a bloody war. While Greenville is an island to the east of Papua New Guinea, horrors have occurred there. 20,000 people killed. It is an apocalyptic story of a ravaged people. Guns brought a lot of pain. We had slaughtered one another. We didn't trust each other. Panguna mine was the catalyst for the civil war. Outsiders were needed to come and broke a peace. The Maori concept group and a good shipment of guitars are going to be the main weapons in our arsenal. Who, as a commander, would say we're taking guitars and not rifles? Fair to say, felt a little bit naked. Don't give up. It was women who were willing to talk. I was conscious that we could fail any hour of the day. <laughs> Soldiers Without Guns is a film which recounts and shows us a true story that contradicts the most basic assumptions of politics, foreign policy, and populist sociology. It's a true story of how a war was ended by an army without guns, determined to, to, to unite people in peace, and instead of guns, 
these peacemakers used guitars. It's a story that should be much, much better known of a Pacific Island people rising up against the largest mining corporation in the world. After 10 years of civil war, they had seen 14 failed peace agreements and the endless failure of violence. In 1997, the New Zealand army stepped into the conflict with a new idea that was condemned by the national and international media. Few actually expected it to succeed. This film, Soldiers Without Guns, is a powerful piece of evidence, although far from the only piece, that unarmed peacemaking can succeed where the armed version fails. That once you actually mean the familiar statement that there is no military solution, real and surprising solutions become possible, but not simple or easy. There are many courageous people in this film whose decisions were critical to success. World Beyond War would like the world, and in particular, the United Nations, to learn from their examples. Congratulations, Will. You have generously shared this film all over the world, in Prague, Vienna, Sydney, Brisbane, many towns and cities in New Zealand, and of course, online. And now you're making it available to the public to watch. Thank you so much for your generosity. In doing this, you have raised our spirits and our hope about what is a, can be possible when resources are used for the good and humanity is respected. Will, you say that it took you 13 years, one divorce, one armed holdup, and one bankruptcy to make this film that changes the way we think about creating an end to war. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Well done. Thank you. And here's thank you board. very much for the Wow, cool. I can't wait to get that in New Zealand. <clears throat> so I've posted the address. So yeah, that's wonderful. Looking forward to getting that. Thank you. Wonderful. So would you like me to start with just a few words? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, so um, firstly, you know, it's a great honor for me to get this award. Um, you know, I've I spent a lot of time in Israel in my 20s, and I saw the conflict over there, and I couldn't really see an end to how that conflict was ever going to stop. And I looked at these endless wars around the world and thought, I actually felt hopeless. I felt there was no way that anything could really end, that there was much that could be done. And then... I went to Juno School in New Zealand and I followed the New Zealand Army that said they were going to go over to Bougainville and end a war using guitars. I thought they were crazy. So I followed that story. And then um, as I got older, um, you know, I used to tell the story as I travel around. And then I thought I would love to follow the story and actually do the story. So I made a, a, a very, you know, bold effort to actually do my first feature film. And if you anyone knows much about films, they cost typically cost you know, a minimum sort of budget's half a million. So it took a long time to raise that sort of money, mostly privately myself. Um, and I said about telling this story about ending war using music, um, aroha, which means love in New Zealand, um, and kindness, how to end war. So that was the, pretty much the premise of the story. Um, and what I found fascinating, I suppose the first most fascinating thing about this particular conflict was that there'd been 14 failed peace agreement so um new zealand jumped into it and says well look you know there's been 10 years of war we don't new zealanders don't like um you know conflict and we we want resolution but what really brought it to a head was that the P, the papua new guinea army had engaged a whole lot of mercenaries so we were suddenly about to for the first time in new zealand's history get a whole lot of mercenaries show up and start murdering local pacific people and that just was a bridge too far for our country um so new zealand stepped in and said look you're not going to have we simply aren't going to allow you to have mercenaries come in and just murder local people that might happen in africa it happens a lot there not going to happen here sorry so 
we jumped in and the first thing New Zealand did is they went and spoke to the people. This is the first thing that you should do if you're trying to enter conflict. And I mean, it's, you know, this is what we're, you know, one of the one of the things is, you know, the second part of World Beyond War is, you know, building peace. How do we build peace? Well, the first thing to do is build peace is find out what started the war in the first place. That would be the first beginning is conversation. So New Zealand went over and says, so why did this war begin? And um, they said, well, it's, it's over land. You know, they, they, they put this big copper mine, they poisoned the people, the land's, you know, untenable now. And they said, well, who's, who owns all the land? And they, you know, all, the, all the men said, well, the land is owned by the woman. It's a matrilineal society. Women own all the land. Um, and um, they go, okay, well, so if the first 14 peace agreements, given that women own the land and they're the ones that are in charge of all this land and the wars about land, how many women do you think that the first 14 peace agreements had, you know? And I asked people this question and they all think, oh, maybe there might be a hundred something. There was not one woman involved in the first, any of the first 14 peace agreements. So New Zealand said, right, let's get all the women over. So they got the women over and said, okay, so how does your culture work? How would you end this war? How would you resolve this conflict? And they just basically, these women gave them a blueprint, cultural blueprint on how to end the war. So really the first thing is to ask some questions. And so once they worked out how, this culture worked then they had a, a framework on how you know the potential of ending this war was and i will say it was very bold to actually say hey we're going to go over there we're going to use guitars we're um not going to take guns and and you know the first 14 attempts had all all been some sort of armed there was always armed soldiers there and it was very unsafe you know, if that's not working, if pouring petrol onto the fire doesn't work and you try it 14 times, then maybe you want to try a different tact. And it seems that these people in the military jobs that are so ingrained in whatever that they're doing, they can't see outside the box. So nonetheless, they went over there and, you know, it took a lot of work. Um, you know, a lot of, I mean, when you when you go over to a war zone, the bit, fastest way to connect to people is through music and dance. And so we have the haka, so they did the haka, which is a, it was a war dance, they played music, they had women, all, all the peace, most of the peacekeepers were female, so it felt very safe for a lot of the men and particularly the women to talk about the problems. So um, yeah, it was just, a, it was just a, a way of building peace, you know, part two of what, you know, World Beyond War does is just, you know, is, is, is peace building. And so it's it became like, okay, we're gonna just freeze the war for a while and we'll be, build peace enough that when we leave, you can have peace yourself, you see. So this was like, they built the peace to a point where they could hand it over. And so the country's now had over 10 years of peace and they've just had a plebiscite and they want to remove themselves from Papua New Guinea. So that's the, that's been, I was over there for the, um, for the elections of, you know, removing themselves from Papua New Guinea. There's not enough money for that to happen right now, but it will happen. So I think a lot of filmmakers and, you know, and, and I'm really proud of the filmmakers. It's a very dangerous business these days. Um, you know, go over there and they tell the problem, but we don't get a chance to see the solution. I think that was one of the goals I tried to do is to do, here's the problem, here's the solution, let's have some hope. And I think if anything, the, the film leaves you feeling very hopeful about there is a way to end war and here's a blueprint and open your eyes and watch it and then you just apply the same principles. You don't just apply the same template because how they would end a war in Uganda will be different to the way they ended in Papua New Guinea. But, you know, here is a framework, and I do hope that this framework will be picked up, and certainly with the help of Liz and David, you know, this thing has been promoted and pushed, and it is making a huge difference around the world. So I'm very happy about that. And, and the goal is that this film gets out to as many eyes and ears as we can see. It is now free. Um, so anything that this organisation can do to use that, and, and it's it, a lot of people use this as... Um, a lot of peace groups in New Zealand have used it to, um, you know, get f things funded, and so they'll have a, a movie night and stuff like this. So anything that I can do in this realm, which is like a, a real passionate, you know, subject of mine. You know, I don't like seeing war. I know the suffering that's involved, and it's a huge business. And we need to, like what we saw Larry do, is he started organising a lot of groups to sort of jump in with him and help. And 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 I think this is what World Beyond War does is they 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 join a lot of groups together and and promote the actual idea so yeah a great honor for me to have this award i do you know thank you greatly for everything 
that you guys do and the hard work Liz puts in. People don't realize the amount of work that Liz puts in. I'm, I'm a direct friend of, of Liz's and just the amount of work she does is incredible. So thank you very much for the award. There's lots of other people that have got wonderful stories to tell. That's that's mine unless you've got another you know, question. But I would say that this film is free and you can download it for free. Are you happy for me to put a link up to it, David? Or what do, do you? Yes, please. Okay, cool. Yep. I'll do that. Yeah. So you have any other questions or stuff? I know there's a lot of other very, very deserving and, and, and wonderful people to hear. I, I was really impressed with what Larry had done. So yeah, anything more you'd like to, to ask? We, we hope to have uh, questions and answers for all of our awardees together at the end of the program. Uh, so, um, I'll look uh, that. Thank Wonderful. you very, very much. Uh, we can we can maybe go to the, the third the third award of, yeah. of four. Um, if you agree, Liz and, and Will. Yeah, I'm happy with that. I'm very happy with that. Let's see. Okay. In Italian this time. Ora o il grande onore di presentare un premio. Now I have the great honor to present a group. Uh, and uh, uh, I remember seven years ago that the Pope gave a speech to the US Congress in which he declared that uh, the, to the largest arms dealer on earth that the arms dealers had their hands soaked in blood and that someone needed to put an end to their practices. The Congress stood up and gave him a standing ovation. And I immediately thought three things. One, blood is invisible or all their shirts will be splattered with it. Two, they will buy, sell and give away more guns than ever before. Three, someone else will have to shut down the arms trade. The World Beyond War members and affiliates do a tremendous job protesting against gun exhibition and even blocking trucks with their bodies, as well as lobbying to reduce military spending and educating about the need to change our priorities. But what has done has been done in Italy in recent years gives an incredible boost to a movement against the mass killing business. Our board member in Ukraine, Yuri Shelyazenko, recently asked for my help in transcribing the uh, text of an old song entitled what what if they gave a war and no one came i want us to keep asking this question but had another one what if they gave a war and no weapons came every year we publish a series of maps, and two of them are the places with ongoing wars and the places that sell the most war weapon. Until this year, with the very unusual uh, war in Ukraine, there has never been any overlap. Wars happen in some parts of the world, and weapons are shipped there from other parts. The places we look down on as a violent are using weapons almost entirely shipped to them and maintained for them from the places we are told to think as more enlightened. What if it stopped? What if a few people in key places that, that is in ports made it stop? The Lifetime Organizational War Abolisher 2022 award will be given to Collettivo Autonomo Lavoratori Portuali, CALP, and to Unione Sindacale di Base Lavoro Privato, USP. 
in recognition of the Italian dock workers blocking of arms shipment to a number uh, of wars in recent years. CALP was founded by about 25 dock workers in 2011, all currently members of the USB Union. Since 2019, it has been working to close Italian ports to arms shipments and for much of the past year has organized plans for an international strike against arms shipments to ports around the world. In 2019, help workers refused to allow a ship to leave Genoa with weapons aiding, to, so, uh, aiding Saudi Arabia and its war against Yemen. In 2020, they blocked a ship carrying weapons des destined for the war in Syria. In 2021, CALP communicated with uh, USB workers in Livorno to block a shipment of weapons to Israel for its assault on the people of Gaza. In 2022, USB workers in Pisa blocked weapons destined for the war in Ukraine. Also in 2022, CALP temporarily blocked another Saudi arms ship in Geneva. Ironically, when CALP began advocating the illegality of arms shipments, Genoa police showed up to search their office and the home of uh, uh, five CALP staff and their spokesman. CALP formed alliances with other workers and included the public and celebrities in its actions. Dock workers have collaborated with student groups and peace groups of, of, of all kinds. They took their legal case to the European Parliament, and they organize international conferences to build a global attack on arms shipments. This small group of, of workers in a port is making a big difference in Genoa, it, in Italy, and in the world. World Beyond War is happy to honor them. Please welcome CALP spokesperson, spokesperson, Jose Nivoy. First of all, thank you. It's an honor for us. We're very moved to listen to what we have done. Uh, it's very thrilling. Uh, so thanks. Uh, we're, we're very happy to receive these awards because as it was said over the past days, as we said to journalists, to our some colleagues talking about this award, we are here in this situation where in Italy we have politicians against us, such as we were traffickers or criminals while stopping weapons traveling across the world. But on the other hand, we have you supporting us. Plus, all other organizations who have supported us, uh, who have provided counseling, legal counseling. Uh, we have also met uh, Pope Francis last year, um, and uh, he um, highlighted, he said once again, uh, he urged us to move forward with our fight uh, against the, um, the hypocrisies of the war market and the war the war industry in the world. Also in Italy, we have um, factories uh, uh, producing weapons. Um, we have started uh, our fight uh, for an ethical reason. Uh, in fact, uh, we didn't want to contribute while working to the destruction of a state such as Yemen for us was unacceptable. So we didn't want to be uh, partners in this death crime. 
So while watching in TV explosions of uh, missiles uh, is just the last step of something of a production starting uh, here in Italy, in our places, in factories um, arriving, uh, uh, going through ports uh, and airports. Uh, so uh, along this whole supply chain, we didn't want to abide uh, we we wanted to um, boycott uh, uh, the death ships uh, crossing the port of Genova. So we tried also to connect all those uh, uh, realities organizations uh, who have uh, um, took a position against um, um, the war trade. And um, we know that it's not easy. We know that our job is an ongoing job. Our commitment is ongoing and we want to um, organize an international strike. And uh, Italy with our USB uh, union uh, had a motto, which is uh, um, do not raise weapons yet salaries. In fact, there's there's not only an ethical issue, but also a political one. We saw now that with the outbreak of war, the Italian government of Draghi has um, increased by 104 million euros daily, the expenditures on war. And uh, over the years, we have seen um, a, a degradation uh, um, of the welfare state, of the rights of workers, of uh, um, the labor work as we knew it in the past before. So uh, fueling uh, weapon factories is a political choice. And today such factories are the only ones in Italy currently um, with um, with revenues uh, producing revenues thanks to this uh, uh, war logic in the past there were wars concerning just states but now wars uh, um, are caused by economic interests so it's all connected with uh, politics and we do not want to take part in this also because it's a viol it's a violation of the um, an Italian law, 185 law, and a specific article, Article 6 of such law, states that in Italy, the um, transit of uh, weapons is forbidden, wh where uh, war is the ultimate goal. So uh, the state, our government, uh, uh, violates uh, its own law when fueling such wars. Uh, and we want to block uh, this whole uh, economic system. And also the government makes up such theories uh, in order to allow such uh, actions. Uh, and we're also accused to be criminals. Of course, we were extremely surprised uh, where policemen came to search our uh, um, homes. Uh, there, were, there were many policemen. Uh, um, there was the special law enforcement security force. Uh, and uh, all our devices, smartphones, uh, political documents uh, related to uh, the war um, issue were seized. And in some cases, also uh, our children's tablets were seized. Uh, of course, you can imagine there were only uh, children applicate apps and games, and they decided to seize um, our, um, our children's stuff. So this was very uh, intimidating. They just wanted to, uh, they just wanted us to um, be quiet while we were trying to build a common um, popular line. And we tried really to contact uh, everyone um, in different uh, um, sections of the society. And right now that's that's what's working. 
So what right now is working is trying to connect as many people as possible coming from different backgrounds. I cannot but thank you and I leave the floor to Riccardo, which is the heart of CALP. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to uh, dedicate uh, this uh, word to all Genoa people, to all the Italian people. As uh, already said, uh, our action started uh, uh, in 2012. Uh, when, when we started, we have a lot of fear. Uh, we discussed between us about uh, the, this problem and this issue. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of reason uh, and uh, we we need to we need to face uh, this, uh, this this issue uh, our uh, behavior was uh, has been uh, criticized a little bit in the past uh, we are very near from uh, from a uh, um, a crisis, uh, a war crisis, and uh, war are the cause, the cause of uh, uh, this uh, forced, uh, forced uh, migration, and uh, all the uh, workers uh, will f will fight for this. And so, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to you. All. We thank you, thank you very, very much. We go to our fourth uh, award of the evening. Um, and for this, we're going to see whether our board member, Alison Bronowski has got, uh, whether technology is letting Alison uh, participate with us. Alison, are you there? No, unfortunately we can't hear you, Alison. So I think we'll have David do the announcement. Well, we are we are going to go ahead with my understanding of what Allison would have said, uh, and, and Allison is a board member of World Beyond War and also uh, the president of Australians for War Powers Reform, um, and she wanted to note uh, that Jeremy Corbyn, our final award recipient of the evening, is someone she has greatly admired, at least since she heard him say he would never uh, use nuclear weapons, uh, a bit of sanity that I think was treated as, as insanity by some uh, in an insane uh, world that we live in. Uh, I, I also want to note that uh, David Hartso, for whom our David Hartso Lifetime Individual War Abolisher Award is named, uh, is with us this evening. A uh, wonderful, longtime peace activist and co-founder of World Beyond War. But Jeremy Corbyn is a British peace activist and a politician who chaired the Stop the War Coalition from 2011 to 2015 and served as leader of the opposition and leader of the Labour Party from 2015 to 2020. He has been a peace activist all his adult life and provided a consistent parliamentary voice for the peaceful resolution of conflicts since his election in 1983. Corbyn is currently a member of the Parliamentary Assembly for the Council of Europe, the UK Socialist Campaign Group, and a regular participant at the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, Vice President, and Chagos Island's All-Party Parliamentary Group, Honorary President, and a Vice President of the British Group Interparliamentary Union. Corbyn has supported peace and opposed the wars of many governments, including Russia's war on Chechnya, 2002 invasion of Ukraine, Morocco's occupation of Western Sahara, and Indonesia's war on the West Papuan people. But as a British member of parliament, his focus has been on wars engaged in or supported by the British government. Corbyn was a prominent opponent of the 2003 begun phase of the war on Iraq, having been elected to the steering committee of the Stop the War Coalition in 2001, an organization formed to oppose the war on Afghanistan. Corbyn has spoken at countless anti-war rallies, including the February 15th largest ever demonstration in Britain, 
part of global demonstrations against attacking Iraq. Corbyn was one of just 13 MPs to vote against the 2011 war in Libya and has argued for Britain to seek negotiated settlements to complex conflicts such as in Yugoslavia in the 1990s and Syria in the 2010s. A 2013 vote in parliament against war, uh, against Britain joining the war in Syria was instrumental in dissuading the United States government from dramatically escalating that war. As Labour Party leader, Jeremy Corbyn responded to the 2017 terrorist atrocity at the Manchester Arena, where suicide bomber Salman Abedi killed 22 concert goers, mainly young girls, with a speech that broke with bipartisan support for the war on terror. Corbyn argued that the war on terror had made British people less safe, increasing the risk of terrorism at home. The argument outraged the British political and media class, but polling showed it was supported by the majority of the British people. Abedi was a British citizen of Libyan heritage, known to the British security services who had fought in Libya and was evacuated from Libya by a British operation. Corbyn has been a strong advocate for diplomacy and nonviolent resolution of disputes. He has called for NATO to be ultimately disbanded, viewing the buildup of competitive military alliances as increasing rather than decreasing the threat of war. He is a lifelong opponent of nuclear weapons and supporter of unilateral nuclear disarmament. He has supported Palestinian rights and opposed Israeli attacks and illegal settlements. He has opposed British arming of Saudi Arabia and participation in the war on Yemen. He has supported returning the Chagos Islands to their residents. He has urged the Western powers to support a peaceful settlement to Russia's war on Ukraine, rather than escalate the conflict into a proxy war with Russia. World Beyond War enthusiastically awards Jeremy Corbyn the David Hartso Lifetime Individual War Abolisher of 2022 Award. Welcome, Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, David. And first of all, thank you to you, David, for always being there in opposition to war and an advocate for peace and a very good person for us to liaise with in the United States from the peace movement in Britain. And so a lot of thanks are due to you and many other people in the USA that it's been our pleasure to work with and know over many, many years. And so I wanna record my thanks to you and many others. And my congratulations to others that have received awards this evening. And I was totally bowled over by our friends from uh, Genoa who were talking about the way in which they have uh, managed to persuade fellow workers not to load weapons, which has made a huge difference in the endless search for peace. And I think they go in the tradition of those that have done the same in other countries. Those that in um, 1920 in London refused to load weapons for Britain to try and take part in a military activity against the then very young Soviet Union. Those workers in Glasgow who in 1973 refused to load engine parts that were due to be sent to Chile to allow Pinochet to continue his attack on the, on the people of Chile. There is a great tradition of working class solidarity for peace around the world. And we should never underestimate the power of that solidarity to bring about real peace. There is at this moment unbelievable levels of stress in the world. You mentioned the war in Ukraine, which is totally wrong. The Russian invasion is totally wrong. The war itself could grind on for years, killing people, creating shortages and problems all around the world, and just increasing the bitterness in the whole region and kill people in Ukraine and kill soldiers from Russia. Or there could be a ceasefire. There could be a negotiated settlement. There could be a way out of this conflict. All wars end with some kind of peace conference. Even the First World War ended with peace conference, unsatisfactory as it was in Versailles. That was only after millions had died. 
why don't we cut out the war and go straight to the peace conference and straight to that strategy? Or is it that there are just too many interests involved in keeping a war going? There are wars going on all around the world and wars are not just where the media happen to be. We should remember that. Yes, the publicity at the moment on both sides of the Atlantic in Europe and in North America is largely about the war in Ukraine. But there are 40 other conflicts going on around the world. Some of them euphemistically deemed low level. And I was very pleased that you earlier on showed some film footage of what's go gone on and going on in Bougainvillea, what's going on in West Papua, what went on in East Timor in Indonesia. Uh, we could also show footage from Yemen, we could show footage from uh, the Congo, from many other countries around the world where there are conflicts going on. And what is the thing that um, brings all those conflicts together? Greed, sale of arms, and the demand for natural resources, the demand to drag stuff out of the ground to continue high levels of production in all areas. And so it is those issues that we have to address if we're serious about bringing peace. The reality of the world today is that we have a world divided between the richest and the poorest, both within national boundaries and at a global level. We have more billionaires and super rich people in the world than we've ever had before in our history. And we have more people now on the verge of or in actual starvation and terrible levels of poverty at the present time. And so it is the issues of inequality we have to deal with. We also have to look at the issues of environmental degradation and destruction. More than uh, half the extinctions of uh, animal, bird and um, uh, sea species that have happened in the world's history have happened in the last 70 years. More than half have happened in 70 years, in all the thousands of years, millions of years that the world has existed. Surely that is a wake up call to us, that we cannot go on polluting our rivers, our oceans, our air, destroying a natural life and not having an effect on the rest of us. And because of environmental disaster, because of economic imbalance, because of poverty and because of war, there are now 70 million people around the world who are refugees, people without a home to call their own, people that are facing racist abuse in every country that they turn up at. And in the case of Britain, they're now trying to outsource refugee processing to Rwanda. And I was at a demonstration today outside the Royal Courts of Justice where we were supporting the demand that the, uh, the court prevents the British government from deporting desperate asylum seekers. And I'll give you an example of it. The point I made was that um, people that have arrived in Britain in small boats from France or from Belgium have been uh, taken into um, care and then they're now threatened with removal to Rwanda where their cases will be processed and it's very unclear what will happen to them in the longer run. I don't want people traveling on dangerous small boats across the English Channel or indeed across any other sea, the Mediterranean or any other, but they do it for a reason. Nobody would logically get into a leaky boat to cross a dangerous shipping lane unless they were totally desperate. These are human beings trying to survive. So we need to change the rhetoric and the language surrounding refugees and have a humanitarian and human approach to them. They are also forces for uh, problems of insecurity. So it is about the direction we take as a world. And ask yourself, what is security? I'm constantly being told that to make this country, Britain, in my case, secure, we have to spend more on arms. We have to have a new generation of nuclear weapons and some or other that will make us secure. David kindly pointed out in his um, remarks a few minutes ago that uh, I was condemned for saying I would not use nuclear weapons because I would not be prepared to destroy the lives and land of millions of people somewhere in the world. And in one day, I was um, 
accused of being a danger to Britain's security. This is by many of the media in Britain. I was accused of being a real danger to Britain's security because I was not prepared to use nuclear weapons. The next day, they ran a story to say Britain and the world were in extreme danger because if I became prime minister, I would have my hand on the nuclear button and could launch a nuclear weapon against somebody somewhere in the world. Well, it can't be both. It can be one or it can be the other, but it cannot be both. And it is arguments for peace that we have to mount. And when people say, well, we need all these weapons for security, what is real security? Real security is being able to eat, to have clean water, to have health care, to have a school your children can go to to have work that is fulfilling, to have a life that is fulfilling and imaginative. That is what security is. And a lot of people around the world don't have that security. They don't have a security of something to eat. They don't have a security of somewhere to live. They don't have a security of their children getting education. And they certainly don't have a security of free health care. Those things are all achievable, but they're not achievable if you're spending so many resources on weapons of mass destruction at the same time. And when we're talking about conversion of industries, it's very important to remember this. Those that work in polluting industries that are damaging our environment, those that work in industries that make weapons, they are not our enemies. They are people that have taken an opportunity to work. And so the whole proposals that I've always put forward are two things. One is that we invest in a green industrial revolution to convert those industries to sustainable industries and use the brilliance of technology to sustain and maintain and uh, look after our natural world and our environment. And that we invest in the high technology that is currently used to make weapons to have a program of arms conversion so that that brilliance can be making the trains, the electric vehicles, the ships, and all the other things that are necessary for our decent existence around the world. So it is about the arguments that we mount all the time. And sometimes you can make yourself very unpopular by opposing a particular conflict. And uh, I remember very well that at the outbreak of the uh, Gulf War in 1991, 1990, there were in the British Parliament um, 454 MPs, I think, who voted for the war. There were 17 of us that voted against the war. I don't apologize for that. I was one of those 17, and I believe what I said was right at the time, that that war was not necessary. The residue of that, that war was unexploded um, uranium-tipped weapons in southern Iraq, then a very high instance of cancers later on in southern Iraq during the period of sanctions against Iraq. I was also one of those that opposed the war against Iraq in 2003. And as David pointed out, we didn't form the Stop the War Coalition in Britain to oppose the Iraq war. It was to impose the invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Of course, what happened at the World Trade Center was wrong and appalling. But has the expenditure of billions of dollars on a war in Afghanistan achieved safety? Or has it made things worse? And has it left Afghanistan in a healthier and better place? Or has it left it as the poorest most food shortage country in the whole world at the present time after billions has been spent on weapons in Afghanistan. Wars do not solve these problems. It has to be an approach and a process of peace that we put forward. And so when during the 2017 election campaign, a terrible thing happened. A bomb went off at the arena in Manchester. It killed wholly innocent young people who were going there for an evening out, for a concert, for, for an event, to enjoy themselves. Absolutely fine. That's what they should have been doing. And that killed people. 
and the election campaign by agreement with all the parties was suspended for a few days. I agreed to that. I was leader of the party at the time and I was part of those negotiations with the government and we agreed we'd all suspend um, our election campaigning. And then when it came to a few days later, time to restart the campaign, I decided to make a speech about what I believed to be the underlying causes of our terrorist attacks that were being made. And they were terrorist attacks and they are disgusting and they are disgraceful. So I made the speech I did, which said in terms that the um, conflicts of the past had created the insecurity of the present. And as David pointed out, I was initially condemned by just about everybody and advised by a large number of people who knew this speech was coming not to make it. I made it. And then there was, I think, 60% on an opinion poll three hours later saying that I was on, the, I was correct in drawing the analysis that um, our activities around the world would come back to bite us at home. And so I stand absolutely by that. So opposing war doesn't necessarily make you very popular. But it's very easy to be a member of a national parliament or assembly and vote for somebody else's children to go off and die in a war. To vote to sell arms to Saudi Arabia, knowing full well those arms are going to be used to kill people in Yemen. To vote to allow arms to be used to maintain the um, occupation of the West Bank, the occupation of Palestine, to promote wars in many other parts of the world. It has to be an agenda for peace. And I finish with this. It is about how we bring up our children, how we develop our education, and how we put forward a narrative for peace. You can look at history on the basis of conquests, of invasions, of wars, and so on. Or you can look at history through the eyes of the victims of the wars. Look at the victims of the occupations and the um, advance of colonialism, of imperialism, and the genocide that took place when those things happened. And when you understand that historical process, you then start to look at the human condition and the ability to bring about peace in the world. And that is what we have to dedicate ourselves to doing. And all of us on this call here, I'm sure, agreed on all that. But it means we have to protect those people that are under attack when they speak out for peace, but also support those people who are the victims of wars and the victims of oppression and aggression. It means standing up for human rights. It means standing up for the environment. It means standing up for justice. And above all, it means developing a world of peace for the future. We could promote wars, we could have more weapons, we could create greater inequality in the world, and that of itself will create the wars of tomorrow, or we can go in a different direction. COVID, environmental disaster, refugee flows, none of those are going to be solved by bombs, none of those are going to be solved by weapons, none of those are going to be solved by high-tech uh, military actions, but they could be solved by our ability to do something very different. It's doing something very different that can make you unpopular, but nevertheless, it is absolutely the right thing to do. David, thank you very much. I'm very honored to receive the award and I don't see it as something for me. I see it for all the wonderful people that I've worked with over many years in CND and Stop the War and in lots of other peace organizations. And just before this call, I was having a lovely meeting with Olivier Bancourt, the leader of the Chagossian people, who is determined to be allowed to go back to the Chagos Islands. Thank you. Well, absolutely wonderful presentations from all of our awardees and everyone is applauding uh, in the chat. Uh, their compliments and and, and cheering. Uh, unfortunately, we can't unmute everybody all at once and have them uh, cheer. Um, I, I want to try to go uh, letting Greta call on those who've clicked raise hand and myself taking questions from the chat. I, I think Greta and I can go back and forth, but I want to try to get uh, at least once to at least uh, to to all of our awardees uh, with at least one question and. 
uh, give them a chance if they have any responses uh, that have come to mind in listening to the, uh, the presentations of the other uh, awardees. Uh, and I also want to encourage all of you and ask you to encourage others uh, to donate at the link that Greta has been putting in the chat to support the, uh, the work uh, of all of these wonderful people and organizations. Um, Greta, does anyone have a hand raised to ask a question? I don't see any hands yet, uh, but you can use the reactions tab and then click raise hand and we will call on you. And if you are phoning in from your telephone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. So we'll watch for those. And also David can start taking some questions from the chat. Meanwhile, just to go in, in the same order that we've gone with the uh, presentations, uh, let's go to Marianne and, and Larry with a question of, uh, can can people send others from other parts of the United States or the world to you for advice on how to do similar campaigns? Have others come to you uh, for advice on how to do uh, similar campaigns to what you are doing in Washington State? Uh, yeah, this is Larry. I, I'll start off uh, with uh, my reflections on that question. Uh, each situation is unique, and we employed uh, what we called a three-pronged strategy here. The first was to try to reverse the commissioner's decision. We did that through a letter writing campaign and through supporting the commissioners that voted against the, uh, the permit to begin with. The second was a uh, legal uh, court strategy, which actually was a successful one. Uh, the third strategy we employed was employing was uh, working with our state legislators to change the law in case the court action did not happen. So we took the long view. And what I would suggest to anybody who's looking at the issues locally or nationally is you need to be working on the decision makers. In our case, the decision makers turned out to be the people of Washington, since the people of Washington own the state parks. Uh, their, um, their views uh, actually matters to our legislators. And so when we got enough people uh, behind us, we actually were ready with a, a, a revision to the state uh, statutes in case that was necessary. So uh, my only advice is take the long view. Uh, there's not gonna be any short-term answers here. Uh, be patient, be persistent, and just do not give up. I think I'm unmuted. Uh, anybody who is interested in uh, working, you know, in asking, yeah, we, we do this for people within the state. We don't know the laws elsewhere, but there are basics to how to organize and how to put a, uh, a campaign together. And we're happy to talk with folks. So we'll give our email. Oh, the email. Um, Larry, you know how to do this stuff and, and you know that I don't. So would you please put our email address in the chat? We and at Whidbey.net. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much. Okay, we'll go to the first raised hand. Quanta, you can now unmute. Thank you very much. I really appreciate all the wonderful work that you are doing. I've been in this work in Raleigh, North Carolina, Charlotte for some time. Um, one thing that I've been thinking about is that we have to somehow find a way to bring to the young people's attention the connection between materialism and militarism. And they should really, it, it would be wonderful for them to examine the speech of Eisenhower 61 years ago, January 17, 1961, in his farewell speech, he did warn the American people of military industrial complex. And I think that that will probably help them to really understand that this is a long-term problem. And if they start now, maybe 60 years from now on, they will experience another world. Thank you so much. And congratulations to all of you. I, I think I'm unmuted. Thank you, Greta. Um, and sorry to jump in and thank you, Quanta. I wonder if we could turn that into a question to Jeremy Corbyn uh, along the lines of 
why did President Eisenhower only say that on his way out the door and not act on it? Uh, and to this day, what is it that prevents us having just about anyone in most Western governments who will take a serious stand for peace? There's not a single US Congress member organizing to lower military spending. There's not a single US Congress member forcing a vote as each one of them has the power to do on ending the war on Yemen or any other war. What, what is preventing people taking a stand within governments? Right, well, thanks, David. I can't retrospectively put myself into the mind of General Eisenhower, but um, I've always thought a lot about the speech he made and the reflection he did at that time. He was somebody that had been the Supreme Commander of Allied Forces in the Second World War, was military from head to toe in every respect. And I get the feeling that towards the end of his presidency, he began to reflect on the power of lobbying of the big arms manufacturers in the United States and the relationship they had with the Senate and the House and the pressure they had on the Department of Defense and the way in which defense expenditure continued rising as the US got more and more involved, which it had been for a long time anyway, in lots of wars around the world. And it was his sort of reflective piece. And sometimes it is, um, uh, older former military men, and it's always men, who uh, have this sort of reflective view that maybe it's not the way it should be. When he said military-industrial complex, I thought that was interesting because it reflected this very close relationship between the military and the arms manufacturers and the sort of revolving door process where many former generals, not just in the USA, but in all countries, um, on retirement, and they usually retire at around 50, then move into arms manufacturing and lobbying on their behalf. And this happens here, it happens in, in every country around the world. And if you look at the war in Ukraine at the moment, it is appalling, it is awful in every respect you can care to think about. And it has become a motor force for increasing arms expenditure all over Europe. It's become a motor force for increasing arms expenditure in Russia. And Russia might be a different economic structure to the United States or Western Europe, but the forces are just the same. The people that want to make weapons and they want somebody to buy those weapons and they want somewhere to use those weapons. Just as the um, AUKUS pact that's been made between um, Britain, the US and Australia uh, to um, increase arms expenditure in South Asia and ratchet up a Cold War against China will have an equal and opposite reaction from China that will increase its arms expenditure and everyone else will suffer as a result of it. And so I do think that um, the minds of um, former supreme commanders are often very interesting to talk to. Last week, there was a, an interview by the um, uh, retired um, head of the British Army, Dannett, who was um, saying that there has to be a ceasefire and has to be some way forward um, in Ukraine other than pouring arms into the conflict. Very perceptive and very interesting comments he made. He didn't get much thanks for it, but it was nevertheless, I think, a useful thing to uh, said and to be part of that debate. Can I put myself in the minds of General Eisenhower? No, I can't. There is a story, I don't know if it's true or not, that he was approached at some point towards the end of his presidency whilst he was playing golf and um, asked to sign some papers about sending in a contingent of the CIA into Vietnam. And he apparently read these papers, chewed on his cigar, folded them up and handed them back, saying, I'm not signing that, we'd never get out of there. And it was left to um, the Kennedy administration that came in to up the presence of the CIA and others in Vietnam, and we all know what happened then. The last thing I'd say, which is slightly tangential to this, but is not much, is that if you look very carefully at the history of South Asia at the end of the Second World War, the Second World War was fought to defeat fascism, and it was an alliance between um, Britain, the United States, um, and the Soviet Union to defeat the Nazi, Nazi Germany, the Axis powers. And in a military sense, it was successful in doing that. It was fought to free Western Europe from Nazi occupation, and it was successful 
in doing that. But when it came to freeing South Asia from Japanese occupation in Vietnam, in Indonesia, and in other places all, ac all across South Asia, the Western forces, i.e. the British and American forces, but particularly the British forces and later the French forces, fought against the um, nationalist forces and waited for the European colonial powers that had just been freed from occupation by Nazi Germany to come there and reclaim their colonies. And then we had the war in Vietnam up to Dien Bien Phu in 1954 and then all the way through to the 1976 when the US finally half a million dead later left Vietnam. And so I think we just need to think also about our understanding of the um, Anglosphere in the study of history as well. Greta, do you want to call on someone, but hope very, very much that they have a question for Will Watson or Jose Nivoy? Um, we have a few raised hands. Yes, I'll go to David Hartso, co-founder of World Beyond War. Um, my question is also for Corbin. <laughs> Uh, Corbin, thank you so much for your life of uh, working for peace and for your powerful presentation today. Um, I, I was uh, greatly moved by uh, Gorbachev's uh, vision of a common European uh, home <laughs> for, for all, all nations. And I think I'd be interested in your thoughts about how we can help uh, overcome this addiction to thinking that uh, you get security uh, by nuclear weapons and by more military uh, weapons and, 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 and how we could really get mutual security for all of us, all nations, all peoples. Thank you. Thanks, David. That's a very profound question. When uh, Gorbachev became um, General Secretary of the Communist Party and uh, effectively leader of the Soviet Union. He then promoted the idea of the common European home, in a sense, pushing for the organization of security and cooperation in Europe to become the centerpiece. And um, he then managed to persuade Reagan into signing a, an arms limitation agreement. And there was a whole tendency towards moving forward to um, peace, uh, coexistence, and reduction in arms expenditure. And um, that was very good and very brave of him to do so. Where it went wrong for him was that the, he couldn't deliver on the economic changes that he felt were necessary within a planned economy in the Soviet Union. And ultimately, the Soviet Union collapsed. It partly collapsed because of their expenditure on the wars in Afghanistan as well. Um, and then after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Warsaw Pact, the whole raison d'etre of the um, Western European military buildup in Central Europe had lost its point, absolutely lost its point. And that was the time for the OSCE to take over. That was the time for reduction in military spending, which did happen a bit in some countries. There was some degree of demilitarization. But I just remember that period when I kept getting invitations from lots of military think tanks to consider all the scenarios for the future. What they were doing was looking at scenarios to change the role of NATO into a global force, and that happened later on with the Lisbon Treaty and um, others, um, to change it into a, a global force and thus ultimately start a new course of increasing military expenditure. There is no future for a world where you simply set yourself a series of boundaries like H.G. Wells wrote in War of the Worlds, or in 1984 written by George Orwell, the whole idea of an eternal war. Surely we should be searching for an eternal peace. You're not going to achieve that by taking up all our resources, making weapons of mass destruction that can ultimately only kill people. And so um, I think there were huge missed opportunities at that time. But there was a period in the early 90s of some degree of hope.
And uh, I think that is the sadness that so much of that was missed and lost at that time. Thank you. I want to go with uh, one of the many questions we have. I have piles of questions for all of our awardees that we will never get to, but I want to get one question uh, to Jose uh, and or Ricardo, and uh, then have a question go to, to Will Watson. Uh, and so the question is this, what support have you found thus far outside of Italy? What stage is organizing at for an international uh, strike? Uh, and what advice do you have for people in other parts of the world who want to help and get involved? Allora, eh, va bene, noi in questo tempo, diciamo, dall'inizio della battaglia... So, since the beginning of our fight, we have taken part in a set of initiatives uh, where we were asked to tell our experience, to tell our stories, uh, who we were, what we had done, and so on. And in such occasions, we started to think uh, uh, about connecting uh, all the... Uh, Support and the labor realities, but also uh, peaceful um, groups active uh, since many years. Uh, so, years after years, uh, we started in uh, 2019, 2020, we started to uh, make this fabric uh, leading us to meet, to a meeting we hold in Brussels in uh, this year june 2022 inviting so many organizations that somehow um, had a connection with us or who had carried out a block or uh, other peaceful initiatives and uh, to this initiative some 30 countries took part um, in europe but also um, other countries outside Europe. And this, thanks to our support, gained through an association called Rosa Luxemburg, which somehow funds, not with money, but uh, organizing trips, uh, travels with for groups, uh, such as groups, uh, so that uh, assemblies uh, and uh, online, not online meetings, but in presence meetings can take place. And during that meeting, we highlighted the need of shaking uh, the whole supply chain of uh, uh, weapons, uh, not binding it merely to ports, which in brackets are uh, one of the main logistic points where weapons go through, but also uh, relating to those kind of uh, um, industries and research centers where weapons are designed uh, in Italy and uh, across the world, universities take part in research. So uh, we had this idea, we hold two meetings with international groups, uh, which are open to everyone. Uh, in fact, we stress once again to whoever um, is like uh, joining uh, our uh, um, event, uh, during an e event, we will share uh, the date once uh, uh, we will have organized. So whoever wants to organize, whoever wants to take part uh, in their own countries with their own means uh, is welcomed. So uh, it's not something just uh, limited uh, to the port field, but we wanted to expand uh, uh, this um, common uh, line with whoever um, takes care, whoever wants, uh, all the wars uh, end. Also because there are no class A and class B wars. Uh, we have blocked uh, the arms for uh, the war in Yemen, but in this meeting also some people from Colombia who had to flee to Spain because the government of that time was looking for them because they were blocking weapons going through the US to attack in the end, ultimately Venezuela. So we are 
we want to have a broader um, attitude. Thank you, uh, Greta. I think Sim had a question for Will. Yes, um, Sim, you can now unmute. Hi. Yes, I really, uh, I really appreciated the um, uh, Will's film. I haven't seen it yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it. The first opportunity. Uh, I was very because I'm very interested because that kind of uh, we need more of the kind of thing that presents alternatives, alternative ways of living in the world without war. I mean, it's good one thing to oppose war and to to want to disarm and and, and denuke and all this stuff, but then we have to have alternative visions of of what the world will be like. And this is so inspiring. The whole idea reminds me of uh, there's another film about a a civil war in. Um, yeah. It's some. Uh, it's one of an African country. Anyway, they had a sit-in, and they actually managed to effect peace by that. So, what I'm wondering is, do you think that there are lessons to be taken from your film that could be applied to the situation of uh, disarming the police? Uh, you know, here we have lots of deaths by by police in Canada and locally, even in Montreal now that they have uh, taken away the gun registry. And in the states, it's always happening. People are getting shot in cold blood. Do you think there are any lessons from your film that could be applied to that kind of thing, to having a police force without guns? That's the one. Thank you, Anne Wright. Yeah, it was called Pray the Devil Back to Hell. Thanks, yeah. Will. You can now unmute. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's lots of opportunity for the police to um, use very similar tactics. In New Zealand, they've always been unarmed, but at the moment they're trying to arm them all up. So it seems to be more of a global movement of everyone getting armed. They'll say, oh, well, you know, everyone's the people are shooting. There's more you know, people being shot in New Zealand. But if you look statistically, it's about the same. Um, so, but they're making a lot of, you know, drama around, you know, anyone that's being shot now. So, um, but yeah, I think, I don't, I don't think it's necessary for the cops to be armed. Um, the New Zealand police have done a really, really good job unarmed. They'll come and ask questions. If they come with guns and just point them, you just end up with a situation where everyone gets hurt. And um, so, yeah, we've been one of the, the last countries, I think, in the world to hold out to this. And um, certainly, um, you know, all the lessons that you can, the blueprints that we got from, um, from soldiers, just sit, saying sit down and talk with these people. So, you know, typically in New Zealand, the cops will show up and start asking questions. In America, from what I can see, they just show up and point the gun and then they ask questions. It's not really a, a, a great position to be in if you're on the other side of that. And that creates such resentment, you know. And what Jeremy Corbyn was talking about, and he certainly is someone that I've followed a lot over the years, and it was great to be, you know, getting an award with him. You know, like we have this idea that security is you need a lot of weapons. And I believe it's the complete opposite. And, you know, he, he makes that argument really powerfully. So... You know, oh, we need more weapons. Why? Because then we, and then what does the other side do? They arm up, and then so the other side then arms up, and so we have an escalation. And, and I think anywhere you hear the word, oh, we need more arms, basically is creating an escalation, which is great for the arm, you know, for the for the industrial military complex for everyone to be armed. That's great, but for us people, you know, um, it, it's very important that we remain unarmed. And you know, the whole lobbying, you know, that goes on in the states and around the world is all based on more weapons and more security and and you know it's like we'll be on war and stuff they're saying no 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 it's the complete opposite and people get narratives in their head if you look at um you know the the constant feeding of like certainly in new zealand now that they're trying to arm the police up they're saying look at all these the these things happening in the states and stuff like this and so we're getting these narratives that are, are, are nothing to do with our country but they they set in people's mind what's going on and and I believe a lot of that is just a, just a, the commercial interests doing everything they can to promote whatever their product is. If they're selling um, vaccines, if they're selling um, weapons, you know, they're just going to push and lobby and push and lobby. And it's not in our common interests. And certainly, you know, um, you know, even making the film was considered by the New Zealand film. Oh, this is a bit too controversial. You know, it's like this anti-war you know, film, we're not interested in anti, why are you not interested in, in resolving conflicts? What is it that makes you feel that when we successfully end a conflict, that you can't share that with the world? What is going on here? You know, they feel disempowered or they're afraid, you know, and this is where we need bold people like everyone that stood up here and got an award and, 
people involved in this organization, they're bold people. You know, this is this is not what the narrative wants to hear. So it's, you know, for me, it's great to be, you know, one, getting in the award, and two, just with, with people that have really stood up. You know, like I've followed Jeremy Corbyn for a long time, and, you know, there was a million people that were walked around London saying, like, we're not, this war's crazy. And, you know, they just went ahead anyway. So um, they're going to go ahead. They're going to try and push ahead. But it's what we need is just our organisations to continually, like, push the, uh, the real narrative, you know, that less armaments is more security. Thank you for the question. Uh, thank you, Will, and thank you to everyone who's participated in this event, and thank you to uh, all of our incredible awardees. Um, you know, the, it's it's supposed to be better to give than to receive, uh, and it's actually true because we get to sit here and listen to the wonderful uh, knowledge uh, and inspiration from people when we give them awards. Uh, and I don't think there is anyone out there in the world uh, deserving of such an award next year uh, yet. Somebody's going to have to go out there and really and really earn it. Uh, and I hope uh, we can all share this video around uh, of these inspiring activists and educators. Um, I hope you will all stay involved with World Beyond War at worldbeyondwar.org. Uh, and that you will seek out and support and promote the work of these awardees. And we will be sending you all a follow-up email with the video link uh, and with any information that any of our awardees uh, want us to send you and any information that's come up in the chat, uh, we will be emailing you shortly. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, have a wonderful rest of the day or night, wherever you are. <laughs>